start. So hello everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, so today we have uh, uh, Julien Delaunay. De okay. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, hello. <laughs> so um, Julien uh, is a, a PhD candidate uh, at uh, Rennes uh, in uh, France at uh, uh, the University of Rennes. And uh, he's actually like at the very final stage of, of his PhD. He's going to defend uh, in the next days, I would say. It's like the 20th, 20th of December, December. Yeah. yes. And um, so, yeah, uh, today he's going to uh, give a seminar on uh, explainability for machine learning models from data adaptability to user perception. He's a, a, an expert in uh, uh, explainable AI, uh, natural language processing, and uh, uh, human machine interactions as well. Um, he, has a master uh, in computer science, and, uh, and actually I didn't say, but the PhD, the, the PhD is uh, in uh, computer science on, on this topic. Under the supervision of uh, Christine uh, Yerguet and uh, Luis Gallarraga. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Julian, for being here. And uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I will repeat what you said. Uh, so I'm Julian Delaunay. And uh, I'm here to talk about explainability for machine learning from data adaptability to users' perception. So I will shortly introduce myself. Um, I did a bachelor in computer science and economics at Rennes University. I pursued with a master's that I focused on artificial intelligence in Sherbrooke University in, the, in Canada. And I continue with uh, research in PhD on explainability for machine learning models supervised by Christine Larguet and Luis Galarraga. And I will defend in a few weeks. So please be gentle, it's the first time I'm presented it's that long. So to continue with some aspect of my personality and some of my interest, I have three main research topics. So first, of course, explainability and making machine learning model transparent, then natural language processing models, and finally, human computer interaction because I think that when you do explainability, you have to take care of the users that will receive this explanation. Um, I have some hobbies. So for instance, I play paddle. I like to run. I did a race two days ago. Uh, I like to travel. Uh, for instance, I went to Jordan this summer. Uh, I also like to do some cultural activities, like go to cinema or go to theater. And if I had to describe myself, I would say I'm someone dedicated and sociable. I like to be surrounded by friends and people, and to meet some people like today. Uh, I would say that I am not bad at communicating. I hope you will agree with that at the end of this presentation. And I would say that I'm organized and efficient. So let's talk about science now. First, why do we need explanation? Let's take, for instance, a doctor that is working in an hospital and has to deal with many diabetic patients. This doctor will have to find the correct dose of medication for this patient and will not always have the time to investigate the profile of all these patients. So this doctor may use a machine learning model that will take information of a patient and predict the right level of medication. However, if this model is like neural network or a very complex ensemble model, this model is a black box and the doctor don't know if he can trust this prediction or not. So for instance, if the model says that we should stop giving medication to the patient, can the doctor accept this prediction like that? No. So that's why we need explanations. If I take a more precise example, if we take a model that take as input the age of a patient, its tension, its gender, and its temperature, and predict the level of um, medication, if this model is a black box, then the users can wonder why it's the level of medication spent from normal to no medication. And this is also the case for the patient and the doctor. So one way to explain could be to indicate how each features, so for instance, the age and the gender of the people impact this prediction. We call this explanation feature attribution, and we use this information to indicate how the model came to this prediction. But there is also other explanation technique. So there is feature attribution, but there is also example technique that will show you another example that is predicting differently by the model. And there is also rule-based explanation. 
So I will now describe more in detail this different type of explanation, and I will start with the rule-based technique. So these techniques uh, approximate the decision boundary of a machine learning model with rules. So if you take the graph on the right here, you can see that the decision boundary of the model is represented by the dark dashed line, while the explanation is represented by the red squares, which compose a rule. So for instance, if we take our diabetic patient, the rule can be if the user has a tension between 160 and 180 while being under 28 years old, then the level of insulin is normal. That would say that if this condition I uh, accepted, then the model will almost always predict that the level of insulin should be normal. This type of explanation have been employed for a long time as proxy for domain experts, and that's why they are widely used for a long time. A second type of explanation are example-based. So we have either prototype or counterfactual, and I will, in the rest of this presentation, only talk about counterfactual explanations. So this explanation shows the minimum changes that are required to modify the prediction. So for instance, if we keep on the graph on the right, if we have the target instance for which we want to explain the prediction is the yellow uh, star, one counterfactual could be the blue just on the side, because the prediction of the model is not the same, and it's close to the target instance. If we take an example here, changing the tension would make the model change its prediction. And that could be an indication on what to change for the model to modify its prediction. This type of explanation are more and more used because social science indicated that they are closer to the way we human reason and explain to other humans. And lastly, the one I talked to you at the beginning, the feature attribution technique. These techniques are the most widely used. Some of you may know, for instance, slime or shop. And today I will only refer to the linear explanations, so mostly lime. Uh, these are explanations that, as you can see on the graph, will use a linear function as a red line to approximate the decision boundary in the locality around this target instance. So the coefficient of this linear model will be used and returned as an explanation to indicate the weight of each features to the final prediction. So for instance, here, the weight of associated to the feature age will be will indicate its importance and the direction if it's increasing or decreasing the level of insulin, for instance. So now I will start to present my first contribution during my PhD. So I will start by the problem we try to tackle. So I told you linear explanations are widely employed, but we wonder, are they adapted to every local situation? Is it better no. now? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. No problem. Okay, so I said that the graph on the left, it's clear that a linear expansion is adapted since it can approximate the decision boundary close to the target instance, while on the graph on the right, it's not clear. We have three linear functions that could approximate the decision boundary, and we don't know we don't know which one is the most adapted. And returning the three explanation is too complicated for the users. And for instance, if we return both the expansion on the left and on the right, they are contradictory, which is not useful for a uh, user. So to solve this problem, we propose some okay. Contribution. So first, we propose a novel counterfactual explanation technique that we call Greenfields. Second, we propose an oracle that is able to answer the question, when are linear explanation adapted? And finally, we propose two novel methods that generate linear explanation if the oracle says that it is adapted and a rule-based explanation otherwise. So 
we did a paper that we called When Should We Use Linear Explanation that I presented at the International Conference on Information and Knowledge Management last year. So in this framework, we, we had some input assumption. First, we need a target instance for which we want to explain the prediction. We want to have a black box model, which, which is predicting. And we also want a data set to investigate some information. So the first idea was how to detect if a linear model is, is adapted. We need to find where is the decision model. So to do so, we base our work on growing spheres, which is a method to find the closest counterfactual. The idea of growing sphere is very intuitive. You have your target instances, here the red circles, and you will create a sphere with random noise adding to this target instance that will allow you to generate artificial instances. And while there is no counterfactual within this hypersphere, you will increase the size, increase the noise that you add to your target instance until you find the closest counterfactual. So, but growing spheres has two main drawbacks. First, it perturbs in all direction at the same speed, meaning that, for instance, the age of the individual and its tension will increase at the same speed, same rate. Secondly, it doesn't deal with categorical features, such as the gender or the marital status of an individual. So to solve these two drawbacks, we introduced growing fields that now generate not more in a sphere, but in a field, because growing fields employ the mean and standard deviation of each feature to perturb and control the perturbation more accurately. Secondly, we deal with categorical features by using the radius or the amount of noise we add to the target instance as a probability of changing a categorical value. So for instance, if the radius is 0 0.2, we'll say that when we generate artificial in instance, the gender may change with a probability of 0 0.2. We made some experiments to verify that our method is better than growing spheres. So we measure the distance between the counterfactual generated by both growing sphere and growing fields against the closest instances from the data set. We obtain this graph where you can see on the x axis five, different, five various black box machine learning models. And on the y axis, you have the distance where we want to be the lower possible. You have growing spheres of the opponent with the red bar and our method in blue. What we can see on this graph is that growing fields generate more realistic instances than growing spheres. Okay, so now we know where is the decision boundary. We want to analyze the distribution around this, this, this decision boundary to answer the question, when are linear explanations adapted? So we propose an oracle that take the assumption as I told you before. So the target instance, the decision boundary, and some information about the data set. Our oracle will then use our method to find where is the closest counterfactual and will generate around this counterfactual. We'll only keep the instances around a given locality to maintain a local explanation. And we'll then run an inimodality test around this set of friends, so instances that are classified as the target instance and enemies, so instances that are counterfactual, classified differently. An anybodality test is a test that verifies if the instance can be grouped into one or several clusters. If the test says that both the friends and the enemies are anymodal, then we conduct a, a simple linear suitability test. And if it passes, we say, OK, go for a linear explanation. It's adapted. But in case where we change the input and we run our growing fields, so we generate instances around it, we find where is the decision boundary. We conduct our unimodality test, and we find, for instance, that enemies can be grouped into two clusters. Then our oracle will say, no, a linear explanation is not adapted. Now we experimented on to verify that this oracle is indeed able to find when a linear explanation is adapted. So this first experiment was the adherence. So we wanted to verify if there is agreement between the linear explanations classification and the classification by the model we are trying to explain. So to do that, we use the accuracy of the linear surrogate when it is indicated as adapted by the oracle compared to not adapted by the oracle. So we call this metric the delta accuracy for this presentation. Uh, we measured it on 12 datasets and six machine learning models. 
And for each instance, what we did is we used growing fields to generate artificial instances around the decision boundary. And for each of these instances, we measure the accuracy between the surrogate and the black box prediction. We obtain this graph where you can see on the x-axis the various data sets and on the y-axis the delta accuracy. Here we want to be over zero because a delta accuracy of zero means that using the oracle doesn't increase the agreement of the adherence of our linear explanation. We can see that we are for every data set and black box model above zero, meaning that the oracle is able to find situation where a linear expansion is adapted. And we can also find that it's more useful for ensemble models such as the voting classifier here in orange. We also ran a second round of experiments that is measuring the fidelity. So to do that, we used what we call class box classifiers. So these classifiers are used, but we know which features are used by the classifier to make a prediction. So for instance, if we use a decision tree, we can follow the path in the tree that give to the a prediction. And we use this set of uh, features that we know are really employed and compare them with the feature written by the explanation. So for instance, we can see if the explanation is using the feature used by the model or not. We measure the canalto between the this on when the oracle indicates that the linear expansion is adapted. So it is adapted in blue. Here is the bar at one. And when it is not adapted, the bar in red. What we can observe is that when the oracle indicates that a linear expansion is adapted, it always it returns features that are really used by the black box model. Well, when it says it's not adapted, most of the time features are not really used by the black box model. So what we can say is linear surrogates find the feature employed when the oracle indicates that it is adapted. Based on this oracle, I developed a framework that I called APE for adapted postdoc explanation. So I start with my assumption. So I have my target instance, my classifier, and my data set. I will then use my oracle to find if an explanation, linear explanation is adapted or not. I will use this oracle and use the counterfactual as an explanation that I will keep. I will also train a linear explanation in this locality. And I will return both the counterfactual and the linear expansion as adapted. But in the case where a linear expansion is indicated as not suitable by the oracle, I will try to find the counterfactual for each cluster centers if there are various. And I will train a rule based explanation. So I will go to this part just after. And I will return both the counterfactual and the rule based as explanation to the user. So I propose two methods that uses this framework, APE-A and APT. So this framework uses the assumption, as I told you. We'll use an oracle that will indicate if a linear expansion is adapted or not. So if the linear expansion is adapted, both methods will return a linear expansion. But in case where the oracle said that it is not adapted, we'll return either a rule-based, so here based on the method anchor for APE-A, or a decision tree, like here, with APT. So these are the two methods we propose. And we made some experiments to verify their improvement. So we compared the average adherence of APN and APT against LIME and local surrogate, two methods of linear explanation. We measured it on five black box models and 12 datasets. So we obtained these results where you can see on the x-axis the various black box model and on the y-axis the average accuracy of each explanation method compared to the black box. We have the opponent lime and local surrogate in red and blue and our two methods in green and purple. And as you can see, it's clear that changing and adapting the explanation to the target instance and the model increases the fidelity of the explanation method. So to summarize this first contribution, uh, we introduced growing fields, a method to find the best counterfactual. This method is generates the artificial intelligence based on the mean and standard deviation of each features and is able to deal with categorical features. Secondly, we introduced an oracle that is able to determine if a linear expansion is adapted or not. And finally, we developed 
a framework that we called APE with two novel methods that return a linear explanation if it is indicated as adapted by the oracle or a rule based otherwise. Just take away message from this part of the presentation. First, the key to characterize the decision boundary is a proper search for counterfactual. And second, we did some ablation study in the paper and my thesis to verify that linear suitability is not enough, linear separability is not enough to determine linear suitability. So we verify if the unimodality test alone or if the linear separability test alone are enough. And we discover that not. Um, previous research has focused on adapting the explanation to the model. So for instance, a neural network or a sample model. And I'll always return a single explanation type. So always a counterfactual or always a linear explanation. Well, we, what we propose is to adapt the explanation to the situation, both the target instance and the model. And we also propose to return several explanation methods. So for instance, linear explanation and counterfactual or rule-based and counterfactual. But now I will present you some part of my, what I studied in the second part of my thesis, which is about the users. So I told you there exist various ways to generate explanation, but the users doesn't know which one to take and why. He has no information whether, for instance, the feature attribution will make him better understand the example-based method. So what I proposed in my thesis is a methodological framework for helping researchers to conduct user study. And this user study aims to investigate the impact of explanation, so for instance, technique and representation on users. And we also propose some metrics to measure user's trust and understanding in AI model. We also conducted a user study with more than 250 crowd workers on two domains, either predicting the, the risk of obesity or predicting the risk of recidivus for American prisoners. So this work has been the subject of papers that is under review at CHI, so International Conference on Human Factors and is entitled Impact of Explanation Techniques and Representation on User Strengths and Comprehension. I've been collaborated with Nils van Berkel. I went to Denmark for half a year to work on this human-computer interaction with him. So we came with two research questions. Uh, the first question was more on the explanation technique, and we wanted to identify which explanation technique. So counterfactual feature attribution or rule-based provide the best expansion in terms of user's trust and comprehension. We focus on these two aspects. And the second research question was more on the representation of the explanation. So how does the representation impact the user's trust and understanding? We face some challenges when designing this study I want to share you. Uh, first, uh, determine which use case so on which domain we want to evaluate, it was difficult because we need a domain that is at the same time under understandable by the users and not complex enough and complex enough to require an AI model. So that's why we came to the risk of obesity and the predicting the risk of recidivus for American prisoners. And secondly, how to represent this different explanation technique under a common representation. So because as you show, as I show you through this presentation, we can present it geographically, geometrically, uh, graphically, and textual. And we needed to find one way to represent all this explanation technique under the same representation. So I don't think I will, but uh, I've planned to show you this different uh, questionnaire, but uh, I won't do. Uh, here is how we presented to the participant of our study the information. So for instance, you have here the different features of the individual. Here you have the information from this individual. And the users had to predict the risk of obesity based on only this information. We represented the feature attribution explanation as following. So here you have on the different column represented by different colors the categories of weight. And you have on the for each line feature information. So for instance, number of daily meal, and in bold, it's the answers from the user. So here, more than three. What we represent in this bar is the weight of each feature in the final prediction of the AI, and if it impacts positively or negatively. We 
selected this graphical representation for the rule-based explanation. So here we indicate by the proportion of individual predicted as the target intent. So for here, it's LC. So this representation indicates that if an individual is monitoring its calorie consumption, then the model will predict that it is LC with 83% of the time. But if at the same time, the user is also under 20 years old, then the model will always predict that it is LC. And lastly, we presented the counterfactual explanation like following. So here you have the initial prediction, LC, and we in indicate here by how much changing one attribute value modifies the AI prediction. So for instance, changing the consumption of high caloric food and the consumption of food between meals will make the model predict overweight. Just to summarize, so we have these three different graphical representation, and we also propose to use textual representation for each of them. And the idea and the purpose of this study is to help the users identify which method to choose and which representation, depending on what they need. We made this experimental design where you have on the right the demographic information of our participants. We used seven different groups, so two groups for each explanation technique and one control group for individual without any explanation. And within each group, we had 20 participants. The average completion time was 15 minutes, and we use the platform Qualtrics to design the 14 surveys, seven per domain. So either predicting healthcare, obesity, or predicting recidivism. We use Prolific as a platform to find the crowd worker. Prolific is more ethical than Amazon Mechanical Turk. And here is the methodological framework I propose to help researchers conduct user study investigating the impact of explanation. So we first add an introduction round where we present to the users the domain, the explanation, what they look like and what they do. We then ask the users to make a prediction based on the information I showed you before. So is the individual obese or is it underweight? It may indicate its confidence in his own prediction. And then we present in the machine learning model prediction and the explanation. This part is the only thing that changed between the 14th the seventh service. Once the users have seen both the prediction and the explanation, he can he has a small task that will we ask him to indicate what are the features the most important for the model, and we ask him to reconsider its prediction. So we can change it or not, and we do it four times or n time it depends of the uh, the participant and the task of the study, and at the end we add. We propose to use post questionnaire to verify the trust, the satisfaction, and the understanding of the participant in the AI model. We analyze this result through an ANOVA analysis with a linear regression model. We add three independent variables, the explanation technique, so either feature attribution, rule-based, or counterfactual. And we use two uh, the explanation representation, graphical or textual. And finally, some demographic information, such as the gender or the age. The dependent variables we aim to predict with this variable were the user's perception of trust and understanding, and also their behavior in trust and understanding. So I will try to explain you the results we obtained. So this is the ANOVA table for the understanding. We split it for each uh, domain, so either recidivism or obesity. And within it, we have the self-reported and the behavioral results. Each line represents an independent variable, so explanation technique, representation, and some demographic information. The last is the interaction between the representation and the explanation technique. Statistically significant results are highlighted by the small asterisks as here. The first result I will show you is the precision. So this matrix is represents the ability of the users to find and to return which features are important according to the model. So does the users find the important features? We represented on each uh, column the different expansion technique. And for each color, it's a different domain, so obesity of compa or compass. 
or recidivism and obesity. Um, what we observe is the precision is higher for rule-based explanation than for counterfactual explanation, for instance, and that counterfactual explanations lead to same precision as the control group, so people without explanation. We obtain also significant results for the recall, and we observe the interaction between the explanation technique and the representation. So we have here again the explanation technique, and the color indicates the way we represented the explanation. What we observe here is that depending on the method, one representation may be better than the other. So for instance, if we take the rule explanation, the graphical representation is less performance than the textual representation, while for the counterfactual, it's the opposite. A graphical uh, representation is better than textual representation. But overall, what we also discover is that the recall is way higher than for the control group without explanation. We also analyzed the user's perception of understanding when they were facing the explanation. So here we also have the different explanation technique and different domain. So th the results are more significant for the obesity domain. And we observe that users perceived as they understood more the model when they were giving rule-based explanation. While for counterfactual, it's, they didn't feel very like understanding the explanation. I do the same for the results we obtain on trust. So here it's again our ANOVA analysis. Um, the first metric we investigate was does the users follow the prediction? So as I showed show you and told you before, the users make an initial prediction. And then after seeing the AI model and the explanation, we ask him to reconsider its prediction. And we wanted to, to verify does the users follow the AI model prediction? So we measure if the user is changing its prediction to follow the AI. Here we present the results for explanation technique and representation. And what we observe is that the representation here is the same. Uh, when it is graphical, it's better for rules, while textual representation of rules lead to smaller trust, or people changing less their prediction, while it is the opposite for the counterfactual. A textual representation makes them more change their, pro their prediction than the graphical representation. We also measure the perceived trust in the AI model. So we ask the users, do you think you can trust this model? And we observe that here, the representation is more important than the explanation technique. So we show here the different representation of the explanation. So here, either graphic, textual, or no explanation. And what we discovered is that users uh, feel they can trust as much the model when they're giving a textual representation as no explanation, while graphical representation increases the perceived trust. We came some discussion from these results. First, the explanation helps users to identify which factors led to a prediction. And second, it can help the users to gain trust in the model. Secondly, rule-based expansion are the most powerful tools to make the users understand and trust the model. And we expect these results because if they are very clear, when you have a rule, you know when it applies and it will apply every time. And we also expect that it aligns more with our educational background. We are used to learn from rules, so it may be why we are more tend to accept rules. We also discovered that counterfactual explanations give slow users understanding but high trust. And we think that this may be due to the nature of the explanations because they are not showing what are the important features. They are showing what we need to change to modify the prediction. So it's not the same aspect than, for instance, the rule. And we also think that it's the way we measure the understanding. We ask the users to indicate which feature are important, but it may be another task that could show that users understood the counterfactual explanation. We also discovered that presentation of the explanation shape the trust of the users in the model, and that graphical representation will tend to increase the user's acceptance more than textual. We expect this to be related to cognitive bias, that users, when facing Graphical representation will say, oh, it's more complicated, so it's more, we, I can trust it more than only a text. 
And we also discovered that existing representation were preferred by users. So for instance, rules and counterfactual are more textually represented, while feature attribution is more graphical, and that's where they obtain the better result. Um, during my thesis, I had two main impacts. So first, I worked on how to generate the best expansion from a data perspective. Uh, I worked on when should we use in linear expansions, as I presented you. I also work on improving anchor based explanation. So it's a technique based on rule uh, that I try to improve. I also work on counterfactual and natural language model processing. So explaining a black box without a black box. The purpose is to identify, is it useful to use complex model like variational encoder or GAN to explain a model? And I find that it's not always useful. Um, and in the second part of my thesis, I study how to generate the best explanation from a user's perspective, and I presented you both the methodological framework and the impact of the explanation. I also collaborated during this thesis on different projects, and I will use one of these as a perspective to work with you here in BSC. So I did this work with a colleague at my laboratory in France um, that will be presented soon in a workshop on natural language processing model analyzing and interpreting neural network for NLP. So I told you until now about local explanation, but there are some issues with this kind of explanation. First, we require some data that may not be accessible due to confidentiality or privacy. Secondly, selecting a representative data to make an explanation is hard. We cannot know if this data will comport, will uh, have the bias that we want to find, or if it is representative of all the search space. And this type of explanation explains the decision for this input and this input only, meaning that it has to be the most representative of the search space. We, you all may have heard of ChatGPT and all these language models. So this model work by predicting the probability of the next word given past one. So for instance, here you give to the model a prompt that will say the cat sat, and it will return the next the word with the highest probability following this text. So here if we say that hun is the next word the most probable. And then it will use this as new prompt and predict what is the next word with highest probability until the text is generated. However, there are few options to control the generation besides the prompt. Uh, we can add some constraints, for instance, uh, emotion inside the prediction uh, or the writing style, etc. So for instance here, if we don't add a constraint, the model will say normal, but if we say, try to make a text that is fear, it will say, I feel terrified. We call that constraint text generation. The idea in our study was to use cooperative textual generation. So cooperative is using an ex the score of an external model, so a classifier, to guide the generation in order to make the uh, text generated that correspond to this classifier model. So to do that, the language model will generate text following the contribu conditional distribution of the discriminative model. And we propose, based on the cooperative generation, a method that we call therapy. Therapy uses the distribution of cooperatively generated text to explain the model. We expect that words that are highly frequent in the text generated will be likely important for the classifier. So we learn a logistic regression on the text generated using the TF-IDF representation, so term frequency inverse. Um, we return the weight as a linear expansion, the weight of associated to each word as explanation, and we use the TFIDF because we wanted to filter the words that are frequent because of the language model, and to keep only words that are important for each class according to the classifier. So like that, we can have words that are important, for instance, with the class positive, and words that are important for the class negative and, all, and not the word like is or z or it. And what I think could be useful in this method with the machine learning for biomedical group is that we could use the cooperative generation to uh, generate synthetic data. So I've seen that you are working on Elixir and it could be adapted to health data. 
Secondly, we can use therapy to generate anonymous. In our paper, we propose to use um, feature attribution explanation, but we can also generate similar example and use different type of explanation. And we can also use therapy to detect sex and gender bias in natural language processing models. Um, I think we can also use this to kind of uh, detect sex and gender bias in chatbot or in large language model. And I think this is kind of the second perspective I want to talk to you today. So how to generate explanation with large language models. We all heard about ChatGPT and we all use natural language to explain between us. And the idea I want to discuss with you today and in the next maybe, is why not using this large language model to generate dynamic explanations? So for instance, there is this model, talk to model, that is an interface between a model and the practitioner. And the practitioner can ask your questions to the interface, talk to model, about data set or the black box model. And the talk to model, the conversation in interface, will answer the users with conversation, natural language conversation. And I think we can do something similar or adapt the talk to model to explore data used by the model in the healthcare data or train a model to predict risk of disease. Uh, there are, I think, different areas to improve this. Uh, first, we can try work on the explanation mechanics used by talk to model. And maybe we can explore some expectation from domain experts through user studies or different aspects. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. And yeah. An email or asking right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Julia. <laughs> uh, yes, if you have any question of the people online, there are, there's a lot of people online, so feel free to, you know, to write in the chat. We will uh, read for you, uh, and the same for uh, for you guys here in the in the room. If you have any questions, yes. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I had a question in the first part when you compare several explainability methods. How is the fidelity compute? Um, so as I told you, we used uh, our method to generate artificial instances around the target instance. And we compared the prediction of the linear model on these artificial instances. And we compared them to the black box model outcome. OK. Thank you for the question. Questions? No. Uh, I have a couple of well, more, but uh, <laughs> a couple of those. So if you go back to slide uh, twenty-four, um, I was just curious to to know if you like uh, dug a little bit more into the different uh, algorithms that you were showing. Uh, almost there. Twenty-four. You said. Yeah. Okay. I think this one. So. Yeah. Um, those are different uh, algorithms, right? Yeah. So uh, and and the and the results are are quite are quite different. And yeah. uh, so, can you like uh, you know say something more about you know those differences that you can see? Probably is de dependent on on the different you know like uh, algorithms that are that are used. Did you delve yeah. more into the actual uh, uh, you know circuitries uh, of uh, of those dif different uh, uh, methods? Yeah. With respect to actually, we had kind of some idea. Um, first, I will say we were kind of expecting that in this uh, results before, sorry, kind of here, we use different type of uh, models. So for instance, decision tree on the forest and logistic regression. And we were kind of expecting that linear model would be better on linear model. Yeah. But we didn't really find this in our results. Uh, it was kind of surprising. And uh, what we find here in these results, yeah, no. um, we don't know 
really why or when, but we think it's important to analyze that here on the green, we used Anchor, while on the purple, it's decision tree model that we use. And in some model, it's better than the others. Like for instance, on the voting classifier, the Anchor is better. Well, on the support vector machine, it's not the case, but we don't really know why, but it's something we wanted to work on after this. Mm. Okay. And uh, then another, actually like here is a support vector machine, but with which kernel, kernel are you using? I think it was like linear kernel. A linear kernel. Okay. Yeah. Um, then another question is uh, is about the um, the second work. Uh, especially, I was quite intrigued by the you know this the study you know, that you performed about understanding and trust. Like yeah. this is really it's it's really interesting. And I was also like uh, uh, intrigued by the results that you got uh, with the uh, counterfactuals. No, that that basically like people seems to. Um, accept at first, like they like better a graphical representation, but they then they are more convinced yeah. uh, by a textual uh, representation. Yeah. And um, and so I was thinking, like uh, thinking also uh, on um, chat GTP and this, uh, you know, like chat uh, systems, like if this kind of insights, uh, if implemented in, uh, in a specific way, can uh, make those systems like more persuasive, and and um, I, I was thinking about like uh, you know on the issue of uh, um, fake news or you know like all the uh, all the you know issues that you can have like uh, having a, an automated system that is uh, you know hallucinating or... yeah so how do what, what is your 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 thought about this like you know to have like more trustful automated machines in one hand which is great. But then the risk of having something that is maybe like uh, potentially, you know, too risky to be so persuasive. No? I see. Um, I think it's kind of a tricky question. Um, I didn't thought about it before. So you mean when we use, uh, when we improve the textual representation, maybe mm -hmm. people will be more tend to trust this while it's not correct. Exactly, exactly. Or maybe like it can be, you know, attacked or like driven, no, in uh, in, yeah. uh, in some way. So like the question is really about like you know like the use of explanations. Like I mean, we we are always saying okay, it's important to have trustworthy systems, but there is also like the risk of uh, you know still having something that is that you trust. But yeah, at, 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 up to which point, no, you know, I I, I know that there is no yeah. answer, but uh, <laughs> I think it's yeah. interesting because we have. Uh, shown some results and then it's the application that will need to take some decision if you want your model to be trustworthy then you will use this kind of representation in this model if you want your model to be like tested and so that the users more understand it mm -hmm. maybe you will use rule-based explanation with textual representation huh. i think it's the choice of the final users Exactly. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking of the same. Like, you know, maybe if you have like an expert of the field in front yeah. of in front of the system, maybe like, okay, you can. Uh, uh, but if uh, depending on, actually, I don't know if you record the the level of education of those participants. I I did, yeah, yeah and I it found was significant like, in, uh, uh, in the actually panel. it's significant for only one result, ah. and it was that people with higher degree were more tend to not trust their ah. prediction. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And actually, it was also one thing I wanted to measure after this study. It was uh, now that I used lay person and crowd workers, I wanted to study with domain experts or mm -hmm. computer scientists if for them the results were the same or if they prefer a different kind of explanation. Okay. Uh, and just following this question, so what is the, the reward to the to the to the users? You ask them, you know, you give them a question, they have to an answer, they, they see this, the answer from the system, from the machine, and then they can change their mind. Yeah. Do get uh, do they get points at the end or, or what is the or we paid them? Or, or there are points or is there any reward to the to the user why they want to be right? If I'm I can say I don't care, I'm right, whatever the machine says. Yeah. I keep it. You can. So is there a are they way are they gaining anything by being right or wrong? Um, is there a right or wrong answer at the end? No, we only pay them for their time and completing the survey. 
and then they can follow the AI or not. And that's also why we came to this methodological framework because it's very complicated to make the users feel being involved in the process. And we did not know how to make them like wanted to answer and use our AI model. But in real life, it's not like that. They, you know, you show the system to a doctor, there is a reward at the end. I make a right decision or a wrong decision. Yeah. So then the psychological framework is different. Yeah, I agree. It was something I wanted to add in the study, but the others say, no, it would mm -hmm. be too complicated. Just stay to that it's already enough. And So you are, in a sense, just trusting the honest opinion of people. My yeah. answer is better than the other people. Interesting. <laughs> uh, so there are uh, a couple of questions, uh, maybe more in the in the chat. So if you can open the chat, we can uh, uh, read those. Um, okay, maybe there is. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if you want to use uh, LLM for explanation, how do you trust that or validate that the explanation is correct? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. And that's uh, what came to one of the contributions I just told you before, like shortly. Um, how can we trust? Can we make explanation for black box using a black box? It's a difficult question. Uh, I think it will depend on how you use it. If you are in a very critical domain, maybe you will have to use some tools to understand and explain how it works. But Yeah, if there are tools to explain LLM, but if we try to use LLM for explanations and try to explain the LLM, it will be always like a circle. So I don't know where we stop. The The second question is about the the control uh, when you are, you know, when, yeah. when you're showing. So basically like this control, like they, they, they're, Rock is asking if, uh, um, if the control is a black box itself without explanation, yeah. uh, there are are the differences you observe to control expected. Uh, do you control for users preliminary trust to AI? Actually, it was not really expected for me when we had no explanation. People, we also ask them, do you feel can you can trust this prediction and this AI model? And sometimes people say, yeah, I can totally trust it. While they didn't add any explanation, so I was kind of surprised. But we tried to control uh, some, we had some preliminary questions. So to measure does the users uh, understand the AI model or the domain, but we didn't control the user's preliminary trust in AI. But this is something that could have been added to the question, but there are so many factors that can be studied that it's difficult to find the one that will not make the study too long and make people continue feeling involved. And the last one is uh, uh, is about the fact that uh, some explanations, uh, like specifically, you know, graphical versus uh, textual, can be complex by themselves. So essentially, like uh, most people don't really read or analyze, you know, the two things in the same way. So there might be, you know, like uh, biases in favor of a graphical explanation with respect to the textual one. So I don't know if you like consider the complexity of uh, of, of the zero. two representations. Uh, I don't know how to measure that uh, actually, but I don't know if you consider this. It's interesting. I didn't thought about it before, um, but it may be correct. I don't know if it says that the other explanation is not correct, but I think the two are complementary. So maybe people think that it's a graphical, so it's more complex, so we can trust it more. And maybe they don't analyze and read at the same time, so they will tend to trust it because they don't want to, to do anything more. As you said, they are not like involved in the presentation. They don't risk anything, so they can say, "Yeah." I you can measure the time that they spend in uh, I, analyzing one thing or the other. And I you, did, yeah. and we didn't find significance for oh, that. Okay. It was only the age of the participants. So, for instance, older people take more time to answer the question, and were also like kind of more precise. Mm -hmm. So, we think younger people are more like impulsive. <laughs> okay, so let's see the time. There uh, is a questions. Ah, here. Questions, maybe. Um, I was wondering if the, I mean, if you tested how your results will change for a more 
difficult problem or easier problem? I don't know. In the case of diabetes and the other one that you and your other OCDVs, were please. they like uh, equally difficult to assess for a physician or I mean, were there equally complex explanations in both cases or would this influence yeah. I mean, the trust? And... This is a very good question. As I told you, it was one of the challenges when we designed these studies, how to find the domain that is at the same time understandable by the person and complex enough to require an AI model. Um, there are some differences between the two. Uh, for instance, we have more features in the obesity data set than on the recidivism, but the domain is more like we can kind of predict if someone is obese or not. Will the recidive while going out of prison, it's maybe more difficult because it's not something that we are going to do every day. It depends. And of course, there are some results, researchers that made some user studies and the domain was not complex enough or too simple and they didn't find any significant result between different explanations. So yeah, that's something that's very interesting, important when you design a study. Yes, and another question is uh, how generalizable are the explanations that you find? Because I wonder if you got two cohorts of people with diabetes and you extract explanations from one data set and then from the other one, mm. would they be the same explanations? Or what, I mean, did you test something like I this? think it will depend not on the explanation, but most on the model, because we explain the model, we don't explain the data. So if the model is able to generalize from one set of diabetic patients to another, mm -hmm. then the explanation should do the same. But if it's not, it's very specified or overfitting on one set of diabetic patients, then the explanation will be overfitted also. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a question regarding the sentiment analysis part that you covered. Um, I'm not sure exactly I understood what the contribution was regarding this part. So um, you tried to identify which words were like uh, positive or negative, yeah. and then you tried to apply that framework or you said it could be applicable for detecting biases in terms of sex or gender. Um, but what what was the contribution compared okay. to other sentiment analysis methods? Um, our model was an explanation model. So you have a model that is predicting, for instance, different class, if a text is positive or if it's negative, if it's toxic or not toxic. And our explanation was able to, without any input data, to say, okay, this model is using this word and this word to predict that a text is toxic. Is toxic. So maybe if a text, a model is predicting two different class of disease, we can use therapy to find if this model is using gender bias or something different to predict that someone will get a disease. And our uh, contribution was this method therapy that is the first explanation method for natural language model using no data as input. So we only give him like any kind of models and it can say, okay, this model mostly based on this word and this word to make a prediction. Thank you. OK, if there are no other questions, uh, we thank again, Julian. Thank you and, for the uh, question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>